Very cool. So yeah, this morning we're going to do something uh, a little different than the last one. I think I could probably do another one or so from the other lesson, and maybe I'll go back and finish it. But uh, I think a couple of weeks ago I said, you know, sometimes I get ideas just from reading the Bible or from reading books, and it happens to be I was listening to a podcast. I should have got his name, but I didn't get his name. I'll give it to you next week. Uh, it's someone I listen to sometimes, a young man. He's a missionary to Romania. Um, he's from the United States. And when I saw a picture of him, I was so happy because he has a goatee just like mine. <laughs> His is a little longer, but uh, he's much younger than myself. But he is, uh, he teaches, a, a he has, does a podcast, and it started off as a podcast on nonviolence, but he goes and does other, other topics um, now. Uh, related to Christian living, how we should be living. Um, this one caught my ear. I was painting on the back of the house this week, and I was listening to him, and uh, I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. So this is, I guess, kind of inspired um, by his, possibly a little bit different, but on the same topic. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Um, and the question I have as my title um, is, is the follower of Christ a consequentialist? I had to say that word a lot today, so I'm going to have to work on getting it out. Consequentialist. So we'll get to, I see Rose already wondering, so we'll get to the definition in a, in a few minutes. Um, but first I want to read uh, a verse found in Micah chapter 6, and verse 8. And it says... He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your gods. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we come before you now uh, to open our hearts, open our minds um, to things that we hear uh, from other believers, other Christians. Um, uh, Lord, I hope that we all listen to other other people and try to glean things that they've learned um, as they live in their walk with you, um, because everybody sees things that other people don't see, uh, and it's amazing when we're open to hear things and we can uh, take some of it at least um, as much as we can for ourselves uh, and learn from it uh, and just see more uh, more things about what you have and what your desire is uh, for us um, as your children walking in the world in your kingdom. Amen. So, I am a consequentialist. I am. The question we're going to ask is, should we be? And as we go through the definition of it and talk about it a little bit, we're all going to think... Well, yeah, we should be, but should we be? Uh, is it an important conversation? Well, once you see where it goes, it is, I think. Um, it's just another way to look at things. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'll present it, and then you, know, you can decide for yourself what you think. But I'm not alone, because everybody here today, everybody on Zoom, everybody walking the streets, from the lowest level to the highest levels, we're all consequentialists. It's how we think. Um, it's natural. It's what we do. Uh, all of the people in the Bible were consequentialists, and we're going to see that, because this morning we're going to look at a couple examples, and then next week also um, at least one more example. Uh, there is probably nobody that's been on the face of the earth except for one, that has not been a consequentialist. And that one would be Jesus. He was not a consequentialist. Now, when you first think about it, you think, how could he not be? Because everything he did was based on what consequentialism seems to be, uh, except for one thing. So as I was sitting and thinking about this, I, I put, I thought about two categories of people. All right, so we have Followers of Christ and not followers of Christ. Now, to me, you can be a believer. This is just my own opinion. 
It could change in 20 years, I don't know. But you could be a believer and not be a Christian or a follower. You believe Jesus and what he did. Uh, you believe that he's in heaven next to the Father. You believe all of that. But as you walk and live every day, if you're not actually following Christ and what he taught and what was taught out, then it's, a po it's at least a possibility to me that you're not a Christian. Because Christians, this isn't part of my message, but Christians were first called that in Acts. And why were they called Christians? Because of the things they did. They were following Christ. And the things they did were obvious to people that this is the things that Christ talked about. And this is what they're doing. Now, I'm not saying those people followed Christ in every facet of their life. But there were some things that they were doing that made it obvious. And so they were called Christians or Christ followers. Uh, and so to me, it seems simple. If I'm walking and living in the world and people are looking at me, they either see... Joe Schmo, like every other person in the world, or they can see some things that I'm doing and saying, oh, he says he's a, uh, you know, a believer or born again, whatever. And the things he says he does or doesn't say and do seem to be Christ-like. So maybe that's a moment of Christianity, if that makes sense to you. But there might be other moments where there's no difference. And that happens to all of us. There doesn't have to be a difference in every moment of your life. It's the things you say and do. But there are things in life that are just what they are, and we all do them, right? Um, so following Christ is a journey, I think, and there's many paths and byways that can lead you off of that path, um, which is what happens. So the, the, two, the two groups aren't necessarily saved or unsaved. They're just people who follow Christ and people who don't follow Christ. So, and that, and to me, that uh, kind of enters into this conversation. Because although we're all going to do, and I'll point to the word instead of saying it again, we're all going to do this, but sometimes, hopefully, we'll think about it, and we won't do it, and we'll just do what we're supposed to do as a Christian. So hopefully, one more week, and by the end, I can show how we should try to avoid consequentialism as often as possible and see some examples and we will also see that tied in with this there is a christian concern that causes consequentialism regarding a relationship to god and that is our concern for doing god's will interpreting god's will knowing god's will however you would like to say it um, that factors into this uh, because sometimes in trying to figure out what god's will is or what we think God's will is, bless you, we end up being what we're not supposed to be um, because it, we start thinking too much. So what is it? I'm going to read this definition, and it's kind of uh, convoluted, it seems a little bit to me, because it's philosophical, but I'll read it. It says, in moral philosophy, consequentialism is a class of normative I hope I'm saying this right, but I think it's teleological or teleological ethical theories that holds that the consequences of one's conduct are the ultimate basis for judgment about the rightness or wrongness of that conduct. Thus, from a consequentialist standpoint, a morally right act, including omission from acting, is one that will produce a good outcome. It falls under the category of teleological ethics a group of views which claim that the moral value of any act consists in its tendency to produce things of intrinsic, intrinsic value. Consequentialists hold in general that an act is right if and only if the act will produce, will probably produce, or is intended to produce a greater balance of good over evil than any available alternative. The second one I found said consequentialists are interested in the value of the outcome for the world. In other words, whether this outcome is a good or a bad thing for everyone or everything with the relevant domain. So the part that, to me, it's the way they described it is this. 
think about something that you think needs to be done or should be done, and you go through the list in your mind of, oh, it could affect this person this way or that person this way, or it could come out this. Hopefully this is what I want it to be to happen. And even if it doesn't happen, that was the intent. And you try to whittle it down to do the best for everybody involved. And it could be you and one person. It could be you and five people. It could be a hundred people and a million people. It could be any, anything. And you're just thinking about it. How do I do it? And the thing that sticks out to me about this is that it will produce. Now, that's a good one, right? Whatever I come up with will produce, but it, the definition also says will probably produce, so you're leaving a little bit of leeway, or is intended for, to produce, which is telling me that, well, in my mind, it sounded good, but it didn't turn out that way. A greater balance of good over evil than any available alternative. So in the end, I looked up teleological and it's, it's a way of, it's a, a thing about ethics. It's a way of looking at something and stepping back to the first cause and to see the steps that went along with it. Were they good? How did it work out? Um, and so that's why it falls into that because it says better than any available alternative. Well, you can't possibly know that until it's over, right? Because there's so many variables. So... The question I ask myself then, when I'm listening to this guy is, I don't do that. <laughs> do I do that? So I need to start to think about it. Of course I do that. I mean, I could think of examples for myself just through my job of how things have turned out. And I, in my mind, I had this, this image of, this is what's gonna happen and it's gonna be awesome. But instead, it's way over here and it was terrible. Right? Because I thought I knew people enough to know that, well, if I do this, then everybody's going to go along and everybody's going to be happy. But as it went along, this person dropped out, this person dropped out, this, and before you know it, I was in trouble. Right? And that's how it works. So we all know it sounds reasonable. If I'm presented with a situation, I measure out the possible outcomes, decide which is right which will produce the best outcome and which will result in the least resistance or produce the least resistance part is very important to me as a person, uh, as my wife will tell you, path of least resistance. I say that to myself all the time. You know, if I'm grocery shopping and I know I need to get to such and such an aisle, I look down the aisle, too many people, oh, too many people. Not because I don't want to be the people, because I don't want to have to weave my car in and I don't have to stop. So I look for the path of least resistance. Not everybody does that. Some people go down that path and they say, oh, I'll stand there and wait and I'll say hi and strike up a conversation or whatever. Uh, either way is good or produce, or you're looking to produce the greatest good for the amount of people involved. Some of these decisions happen quick because we do them so much and it's so obvious and every time it has the same outcome. So we just do it. Other times we take forever to decide to the point where people think, Oh, that person can't make up their mind or they're not a good leader or they're procrastinating but maybe it's just inside you have so much anxiety over finally making it because you just don't know and so what do you sometimes do if it's available to you if you're the head of a company and you have a decision to make what do you do most of them don't just say that's what we're doing they have a meeting they go into their conference room or their boardroom and they have a staff that comes in and you know, they go around the room and the person says, this is what I want to do. And instantly, everybody that's there, because they're paid a ton of money to do this, they have all the data, everything they need to say, oh, yeah, that's going to be good. Or, oh, no, let's do it this way. Or let's not do it at all. So you involve people because you don't want to make it on your own and you want to make sure it's the right thing. Maybe it's going to benefit, you come out to think about, it, it's going to benefit enough people where we'll do it. Some people aren't gonna be happy, but we're gonna do it anyways, because more people will be happy than not. As long as 
the intention and knowing that it probably is going to happen correctly, then we can look back and say it was the right decision. So there's somebody, Carl said we're going to be in the Old Testament, and that is true. But as I turn to this passage, now I'm looking at my notes, and there's a New Testament one that's coming first, Carl. So good guess. <laughs> so I'll turn to Luke 23. One of the biggest examples of consequentialism. Now, this guy in his podcast, this is one of the ones he mentioned. He mentioned several. This, this topic, he has like 13 podcasts on this. I haven't gone through all of them yet. We're not going to go through all of them either. I just wanted to condense some of what I heard and thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, this is one of the examples he gave. And we'll, we'll do it. Uh, we're in Luke 23. So who do you think is going to be the consequentialist in Luke 23? Pilate. It says in verse 1, then the whole body of them, the Sanhedrin, the whole uh, leadership of the Jews, which is big, right? It's a lot of people that were there. They all brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Have you ever read that verse and just break it down a little bit? What nation? Are they talking about Rome? Or are they talking about Jewish nation? Because at this point, there is no Jewish nation. Are they siding with Rome? Because then they say he doesn't pay his taxes. Does Jesus pay his taxes? I think he does. Because what does he say? If the guy on the coin is Caesar, then give him what's his. So Jesus must do it because he said. So, or he just never uses their money. It says, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Big one, right? So Pilate asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And he, Jesus, answered him and said, it is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept insisting, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. When Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And he, and when he had learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at the time. And that must have been a relief. He must have been like, oh, you're a Galilean? Perfect. Right? Off to the next court. Ooh, I don't want anything to do with this guy. Right? Because he can already see in his mind where this is going. What's happening. So we go down to verses 13 and 25. Because now Jesus has gone to see Pilate or uh, Herod and all of the Sanhedrin also, and they went before Herod, making the same accusations. And, of course, Herod also says, there's no guilt. So now they got to go back. It says, Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And he said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. Jesus did not most definitely incite rebellion, right? He was against, completely inciting rebellion, but it happened, or they say it happened. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now he was obliged to release to them at least at the feast one prisoner. But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man, and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. So Barabbas was exactly what they were accusing Jesus of being. Barabbas, even though it doesn't say it, Barabbas is one who would not pay his taxes. Barabbas hated Rome. He was an insurrectionist. He did whatever he could. To make trouble for the Romans. Uh, Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept calling out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why 
what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices asking that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail. This can't be a static, just their voices began to prevail. Their voices prevailing was whatever hall, whatever court, wherever they were, it was loud, it was thunderous, the walls were shaking, they were causing a huge, huge ruckus over this, and Pilate was getting nervous really nervous, probably scared. He's getting to a point where like, what am I gonna do? What am I supposed to do? What could he have done? He is the ruler of Judea. He could have just said, no, I'm punishing him and releasing him. And had the military commanders call the commanders, disperse the crowd, arrest people if they got out of hand and said, this is what's happening punished Jesus, and released him back into the streets. But that's not what he does, is it? It says, and he released the man they were asking for, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Pilate's in trouble. He doesn't know what to do. The guy he just released should be crucified, according to Roman law, for the things he did. And he's releasing him as a free man to probably do it again, which could come back and haunt Pilate in the future. So he's taking a calculated risk. I'm going to release this guy. And if anybody asks me, I'm just going to tell them, look, there's going to be a riot, a huge riot. And if this riot happened, people probably would have been killed. I would have had to arrest a bunch of people. I would have had to fill out all the paperwork I had to fill out, and it would have had to go up to uh, Rome, and where they inspect and keep track of everything that's going on in the provinces, and it would have been a mess. So what's Pilate doing? He's going through the list in his head. Quickly, but in his head, what am I going to do? I think, possibly, when Jesus was with Herod, that Pilate was already going through right? And thinking about, what am I going to do? In John 19.12, it says, as a result of Pilate, of this, Pilate made efforts to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. So the chances are, if he released him, punished him and released him, the Sanhedrin would have taken him and dragged him to a higher court. And then what would happen? Now this guy's claiming to be king and opposing Caesar, and Pilate punished him and released him. Now Pilate's in trouble. So there's all kinds of things going on. It's also important to know that Pilate has a history with the Jewish people. He didn't like them. He did things purposefully to get at them, to let them know I'm the guy in charge, I can do what I want, and I don't like you people, right? There's a couple examples in scripture. One is that he sprinkled Galilean's blood, who had been killed, on the sacrifice, right? That's in Luke 13. That's an abomination, right? But they didn't do anything against him because he's the ruler, he's got all the might, but he did things purposefully. So by the time it comes to this, all this is going through his mind like, wow, I never should have done all those things because this is really, really coming. <laughs> this is coming at me. But he goes through the list in his mind and he decides it's better overall if one man dies, I can explain this away and I keep the peace. That's the best. It's not only be the best for me, but it's going to be the best for everybody in my province because this has a chance of spreading beyond these walls into the streets, into the city, and I'm going to have to call up a bunch of troops and it's going to be a mess. So this is where I'm resting. Now Philo of Alexandria, who wrote things, historical things, he was a Greek man, but he wrote things in Egypt, 
Alexandria, which makes sense, right? He said regarding this story that also the emperor had recently sent out a command that no innocent people were to be executed. Now, if that's true, it tells me that people like Pilate had just not cared. Someone gets brought before, or whatever, crucify him. And maybe things are getting a little riled up because of that. And so the emperor says, you guys got to do a better job at this. Make sure the person is guilty. So that's also, if that's true, that's also weighing on Pilate's mind. Now I'm, saying, I'm releasing a guilty guy and having an innocent guy executed. So it's not a good thing. He tries to do the right thing. He weighs his options. Instead, he ends up releasing this innocent man for crucifixion, one man for the greater good. But looking back, what did Pilate do? He condemned an innocent man, and not only an innocent man, but the son of God is now going to be crucified because of what he just did. And didn't his wife even say, I had a vision, I had a dream. And I read some commentators believe she was Jewish. They say they can't substantiate that, but they think she might have been Jewish. So she might have already had a belief in Jesus. And she's trying to tell her husband, you know, come on, you can't do this. Because if you do, it's not going to be good. So just, you know, release him. Wash your hands of it. Get, get it out of, away from you. Not wash your hands of it and have him crucified, but wash your hands of the situation and have him released because... You shouldn't do this, but he did it. Now, is that fair? Is that fair that we go back and look at Pilate and say, you failed, man. <laughs> is it? We say no, because, or we say no. Yeah, we say no, it's not fair because God knew already that Jesus was about to go through something and to get to that point, some things had to fall in place and happen. And Pilate was the guy, but Pilate was not some innocent bystander. He, like I just said, was already troublemaking with the Jews. Uh, you know, I was thinking about it, and maybe this is stupid to think about, but I was thinking, what if Pilate released him? God would have found another way, right? It was going to happen. Uh, Pilate couldn't have released them because it had to happen right when it happened. It couldn't happen. If it didn't happen right then, then we got to wait all the way to the next season. So Jesus would have been around another season to the next Passover. So no, it, had, it, it was something that was going to happen. But it's, it's a great example of what consequentialism is. Someone had to suffer, and so they suffered. Now everything's good, right? In history, nobody goes back and says what happened to Pilate. I mean, some people, they think they know this or that, but they say basically no one really knows what happened to Pilate. Some people say afterwards he committed suicide. Some people say he eventually did get in trouble by Rome and for something else, that he wasn't really a great ruler in the first place, um, that he came from a middle-class family that he got to his position and it wasn't normal that someone with his upbringing would get to that position. But things happened, he ended up there and it probably wasn't a good choice or a good fit and whatever, we don't know what happened. But that's what Pilate did. The next example is in the Old Testament, Carl, and we find it in 1 Samuel chapter 15. You could turn over there. This is about the first when I was writing my notes, I put the first king of Israel. And I'm like, nope, that's not right, is it? He's the first human king of Israel. 15, 1 Samuel 15. The results of Israel's rejection of God became turned into the first human king of Israel. This man's name was Saul. He was a consequentialist. And in this story, we'll see that. Probably like all of us, he was always one. But this is just a great story about it. He receives a commandment to fight the Amalekites and to destroy them completely. And we start in verse 3. It says, now go and strike Amalek 
and utterly destroy all that he has, and do not spare him, but put him put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Then Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telium, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. So Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, so that I do not destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah, as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. So we're going to read a little more in a minute, but we have to start asking questions at this point. Why did Saul do this? And there's things in here. It says that he utterly destroyed all the people at the edge of the sword, which he did not. How do we know that? Because in Chronicles, I don't have the exact text, but in the Chronicles, we read that somebody else had to deal with the Amalekites. And then even after that, somebody else had to deal with the Amalekites. So these Amalekites, they were like fruit flies. They were hanging out, right? This is fruit fly season. In case you didn't know, it's not really the season. It's getting cooler out at night, so they're wandering in to, to hard take of all your delicious produce that you're buying. Um, you know, you can get those little traps. Uh, they have little holes in them. You fill with vinegar because they love vinegar. And sometimes they sit on top of the trap because we bought, we bought a couple. They look like apples. At least it's like these are not working. Why? Because they all hang out the top. Only a couple would actually venture into the hole. The rest, when you went to grab it, off they went. And when you open it up and look inside, you're like, wow, there's only five in here and we have like 100 fruit flies. So, you know, they're smart. That's what the Amalekites are like. They survive. He doesn't kill them all. And not only that, he does not. Uh, he spares the king and the people... It says the Saul and people, later on he's going to blame the people, they all keep all the livestock. They definitely did not obey the Lord in any sense. So Saul is so excited about his victory. So if you read, if you read up to verse 19, because we're going to pick it up in 19, but he's so excited that when Samuel comes to see him, he's greeting him. With excitement, because he can't wait to share of the victory and how they did everything. Great. He's so happy. And Samuel says, let me tell you what God has to say. And Saul still doesn't get it. He's still like, speak, tell me. But what does Samuel say? Not what Saul wants to hear. He says, why do I still hear livestock? Right? Saul skips over that. Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. Tell me what God has to say. Now, God tells him, and it's not good. So in verse 19, it says, Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. I went on the mission which the Lord sent me, and I have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. So Saul goes out, thinks he's done the right thing, 
knows, probably knows in his mind, I haven't done the right thing, but he knows how he's going to show how he's done the right thing. He intended for something to happen out of what he did that's not going to happen. He tried to think of, how am I going to say this? I did something really for the same reasons that Pilate did it. Saul's afraid. Samuel says, didn't God make you a king and you weren't even fit for something like that? You were a weak kid, whatever, and God made you this. You're, you were a good looking guy, right? Wasn't he like one of the most good looking people in the world? He would have been people's, you know, most good looking people. And everybody loved him, which tells something about him, right? Probably wasn't really a leader. Everybody loved him. And he became a king and God put him in a position and immediately Saul can't do what he's supposed to do. The king is taken alive. Why would Saul take the king alive? I don't think it's because he was afraid to kill him. I think Saul took the king alive because that's what did. That's what they did back then. They invaded someone. They took the king. Because that happens to Israel. Right? They get taken captive. What happens to the leaders in the king? Yeah, some killed, some not killed, right? Not all the kings get killed. He thinks that he's doing something right because that's how things are done in the world. The people need spoil as reward for their hard work. You can't expect us to go in and just kill everything. What's the point? When we take over something, we get something. We get land. We get the livestock, we get the women, we get the kids for slaves, we get something. And what does he do? I mean, you can, this is kind of reading between the lines, but I'm trying to get you to figure out why did Saul do this? There's a reason Saul did it. He didn't just do it because, oh, God said do that, I'm just not going to do it. He's a, he's a man. He thinks. There's a reason. So he's reasoning things in his mind. How am I going to get through this and make sure that the best outcome happens? How can I please the people and not have them hate me or cause problems? How can I do this and make it come out right? Oh, we can sacrifice them because we just took something. So we should sacrifice to please God, to thank him for our victory. And so we'll keep some of the livestock. It sounds to me like they kept most of the livestock. It's kind of like, you know, if you think about it and you stole some money, a lot of money, and someone finds out and you try to give them some of the money, you know, oh, here, you can have some of it too. Or maybe you decide, oh, man, I just stole a million dollars and nobody's found me, but I feel really bad because that was other people's money. So, you know what? I'm going to take a half a million of it and give it to charity. Right? That's kind of like what he did. He was told to do something. He didn't do it. And he says, well, I'm going to do something good with it. I can't tell the people no. Really, in my mind, I'm just too weak. Maybe it'll seem like I'm a good king, letting him take it. And they'll, they'll like me and they'll do the things I ask them to. Avoid a revolt. Make sure the next time we go to battle that they actually go. What was the best way? So after reasoning it through, he became convinced. And so he tries to convince Samuel. And he tries to convince the Lord that everything he did was right. But it wasn't. Because he didn't obey. That's where consequentialism in a follower of God or a follower of Jesus or a Christian is going to get us into trouble. Because we're going to reason things out of how it's going to work out the best, how we're going to offend the least amount of people, how we're going to take care of as many as we can, and the other ones we can't because of whatever reason, whatever reason, whatever reason. And what is per perceived to be the best outcome, how will we, as the definition says, produce, will produce, will probably produce, or is intended to produce a greater balance of good over evil than any available alternative. But it's not what God said to do. God wasn't concerned about that. 
God was concerned about getting rid of the Amalekites because they're constantly getting at you. So let's get rid of them, and then it'll be done with, right? That's not what he did. Obey, and that's what Samuel says. Has the Lord much delight in burnt offerings? Because Saul said, well, we're going to offer them. And Samuel's saying, why? Is God's delight in burnt offerings? And, of course, Saul's thinking, well, yes, because you burn offerings all the time. And Samuel's saying, no, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. God was looking for a king. And in his place, what did he get? He got a guy who could not rule his people. He didn't have the fortitude to rule. He wasn't going to lead them to success. He wasn't the right person. And so he rejects him as king, because God knows he's looking for people to obey him, even today. Now, I'm looking at my notes, and there's this massive blank space. And I was wondering this morning, what is this blank space for? Now I know. When I was putting my notes together, my computer was acting up, and the verses that I put in there didn't land there. But they were Hosea 6.6, which says what? What did God want? He wants compassion, loyalty, not sacrifice, right? Um, the other two were Matthew 12 and Mark 12. In Matthew 12, Jesus tells the Pharisees, what are you lacking? What's going on? Because whatever you're doing is not compassionate. God's not worried about sacrifices. He's worried about how you are living the way you're supposed to be living. And then in Mark 12, the young man is asking, and Jesus, they're talking about, what's the best way uh, for me to get to the kingdom, um, to land where I need to land? And Jesus is saying, well, how? And so he tells Jesus, well, Jesus says, what's the greatest commandment? And the kid goes through all kinds of commandments, and Jesus says, what's the greatest commandment? And the kid says, ah, to love the Lord God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and to love my neighbor as myself. Jesus says, you got it right there. That's it. You obey that, you're there. To obey that, as Saul found out, to do that requires not to do what was on the screen that's gone now. Consequentialism. It requires you not to try to think it through and to think, well, what's the best outcome? Well, what's the best? Well, who's going to come out the best for this? It's not what God's asking you to do. He's asking you to do something. And so next week, uh, we'll continue to look at this.